All right. So um, for now, it looks like this is chapter four, metaprogramming part two. I'm not sure if we, we might want to move it around a little bit later. But uh, it's pretty much all about closures and formulas. So what, why, and how is a closure and working with formulas. And it turns out, um, John, I don't know when you suggested, like when you put stuff in the spreadsheet, if you knew this little tidbit about formulas. Or like why you suggest, or was there a reason you put them together? Or was it just a, it seemed fortuitous? Uh, I don't remember what I did there, but it was something with where things were in mm -hmm. the package down site. Gotcha. So uh, what the heck is a closure? And quote from the documentation, it was a, special type of diffused expression that keeps track of the original context the expression was written in. And uh, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense on its own <laughs> until you start actually learning like how they're used. But essentially, it's just some sort of object that keeps track of its source location so that if you try and reference it, you don't get the data from the wrong environment. You get that object from the correct environment. And so the example in the book, I tried to make one a little bit simpler than realized it wasn't quite happening. But um, if we got this divide by 100 function in the user environment, then we could do um, this other summarized BMI function using mass and height divided by 100. And then that summarized BMI comes from this other package that then calculates BMI using mass and height. And then that gets nested again inside check numeric, which will do stop if not is numeric. And so you end up with this giant um, like chain of stuff where if you called this uh, inside summarize stats, you've got this transmute and the summarize. And then if we were to just inspect this transmute a little bit more and sort of expand it out, then it all would add up to uh, this. And the book, not the book, the documentation used this weird method of noting the different environment levels with the caret operator. And I thought that was mildly confusing. And so instead, at least what I like to do when I write my own code is I'll use tabs where they're supposed to go, but there are extra tabs for things that belong to something else. So if I do a group by, anything under my group by is tabbed over until I ungroup. And so I applied, tried to apply the same thing here, where mass and divide by 100 are both in this, these are both in their own closure. And then BMI is a separate closure. And so is check numeric because you need to evaluate these two first and then BMI and then check numeric in order to get your transmute working properly. Um, and so you need to make sure that they stay properly tracked throughout the environments. Because if we look at the functions we're using, the var with the curly brace um, injection to, to get there, which is a closure itself. So why in practice, it's really just to help you use, like more as like a package author, use different variables that a user could give you. And so if we defined my fun that takes my var, we could call their fun using the curly braces or we could end quote, which converts it to a closure pretty much with my new var. And then we, um, that's not splice, that's inject. Then we inject it in. Or similarly, if we used, uh, if we want to make our own group by, but this one would use any, instead of like dot, 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 any list of variables here, then we would splice it in with the triple bang. And then if we wanted to call it, we would use dplyr our vars, which creates closures for each variable and then passes them. 
And that's just an alias of Arlang Quo's, which is the plural version of Arlang Quo. And I don't know if you guys have insight, but I'm not quite sure why Arlang and some of the like other tidy verse verbs have like single and plural forms instead of just working for one and many. But I think because of the complication of um, like having to inspect the thing to see if it's single or many can change how it behaves. It's that whole, you know, um, observer effect thing that happens with <laughs> quotes. Once you touch them, they're touched. So I, I think that's why, just to, uh, it makes you be explicit about it because there's some different things that have to happen under the hood. Okay, so if we look, ooh, um, yeah, Pranka, like Sim and Sims in our lane, or um, there's a plural only one from, it's um, like bind rows and bind calls only take multiple, which is mildly frustrating if you have a function that can return one or many data frames. We have to make it a list of one, yeah. Well, even then, I don't think it likes it. I think it'll reject it because the list is length one, but I haven't tried it. But it's, I'll try it later. But um, if we look at this closure for MT cars, we can see that it has an expression, which is MT cars, and it's got that little caret, um, just to show this is the expression that is the closure. And then it also comes with an environment. And so empty cars right now, at least for me, it was in my global environment. And then because functions are their own environment, if I were to print a closure inside this function, then my expression is now data and this is my environment. But if I were to run um, eval tidy on either of these outputs, then I would get empty cars back. And so the closure has two parts. It's got the expression and the environment. And that environment is there to make sure that the expression evaluates properly, no matter where you are. And it has three uh, traits, I think they said, which is that it's callable. And so if you evaluate it, it will produce a result. You can't use base eval. Um, it's just not quite designed for it. But if you use eval tidy from Arlang, then it will produce the result. And hygienic, which in this case means it evaluates in the tracked environment, so wherever it came from, rather than wherever it is now. So that way, if you've got two variables with the same name, but one of them is a closure for somewhere else, then you get the right one from somewhere else. And then uh, maskable, this one I wasn't quite able to parse internally, so I quoted. But if evaluated in a data mask, which currently only masks created with eval tidy or new data mask work, the mask comes first in scope before the closure environment. Um, so I'm not sure entirely what that means, to be honest. But I figured it was the kind of thing where if I, if I needed it, then all of a sudden it would make sense. So. Um, there was a note there as well that closures are similar to promises for lazy evaluation, but instead of a promise uh, being like a single use once you evaluate it, then it's done and it's, the result is cached, closures are repeatable and don't cache the results. And so every time you call it, it'll redo it. And there is another neat thing that constants have an empty environment. Um, there is some explanation on why that is with base R and going into like the C parts of it. But if you've got like a constant string or number or whatever, then if you make a closure of that, then it doesn't have an environment. Um, and in theory, like as Tan always says, the mental model, if it's a constant, then it shouldn't matter what environment it's in. So um, then the John, the reason I asked you at the beginning was uh, I cracked up an advanced R when I was looking at formulas 
And closures are actually a subclass of formulas mm -hmm. and are therefore call objects with an environment attribute. So uh, that will make a little bit more sense in a moment. But <laughs> some of the more important helpers for closures. So were... Wait, can we can we pause for just a minute? Yeah. So like both in the documentation and you know going through it here, they have the section, when should I create closures? Mm -hmm. I still okay. don't feel like I have an answer to that question. Like okay. I missed I it's because it's like, okay. well, you should just here you should just use curly curly. And here you should use yeah. uh var or you know our lang vars, or maybe you're gonna use quo, but like should you ever call and quo directly anymore? It doesn't feel like they gave us a case for that. If you'd ever use an expert or an experts, then quos does the same thing. So in theory, you could still call it. If that makes sense. Like it's like do you have a mental model of when you would use like n extras or n sims? Because n quos is like augmented with the environment itself. So if you think about like the name, like if you're modifying the calls to behave a certain way or modifying the names, I feel like you'd use n quos. Here, in all the examples that they've shown are basically, you can just pass it instead of, you know, doing stuff with it right yeah but i feel like you still need it it's like the like quo and inject part i think where like you take in multiple things and then like splice them those are still that's still necessary to use in quotes i think yeah Maybe. okay yeah i think it is it's when you're gonna mess with it it's when you need that object to exist so that you can maybe change something about the environment or you know something like that so that you have this thing that can then be manipulated because otherwise you know you can just pass it or you can use curly curly or you know you can do these things that don't i mean they under the hood they're calling it but they're calling it not you you know yeah i think like the so, only one i can think of is like group buys like diffuse like inject and whatever right i mean even because it appeared in like sure. one of the recent ones. Yeah. Where like they have now an inject operator that you can add to things. Yeah. So in inject, I actually used today. It's basically turn this in, you know, pretend this is our Langy, is what inject does. Mm -hmm. So take this function that isn't all tidy capable and just kind of wrap it. And then you can use uh it was specifically it was that case where i had multiple functions that i'm passing arguments on to and the arguments come in as separate lists so it's it's as if they were like multiple dots basically or you know multiple groups of dots um but that's all i need you know like i can just do inject and then treat it as if it can handle it um so yeah i i, I generally Nope. 10 froze up. Not let them do okay. dark magic. Oh. <laughs> My internet connection. We lost you at the beginning of I don't let them. I don't let users do tidyverse stuff anymore. That's kind of my thought. Like, there's no reason that it should get to end quotes. I'd rather just make yeah. them work around it the other way, you know, or make a vector specific thing and then get them to use it. For, for the most part, yeah. I mean, I say for the most part. I think I entirely agree, and I'm still watching for cases where I don't, uh, which I might still run into. But um, and you know, a lot of times I'm using it just to like I could do it in base, but I feel like the you know as usual the Arlang, you know, the tidyverse adjacent functions just have nicer argument order and things like that and better help. But there are things where it's like, oh, I'm really just doing 
a uh, a call like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but i'm doing it through arlang exec or through inject because it is easier for me to follow <laughs> and i'm importing something else that's going to import arlang anyway so might as well use it that's what it comes down to I don't know that so I still just I feel like that section when should I create closures still Never. like every every time they do these they say well you could do this or you could do that well the second one's easier I'm going to do the other one I'm not going to use end quote um or I mean I guess I could see if you want to uh if you want to use um our lang but not dplyr as an import you might have cases maybe where it makes sense but I guess anyway. maybe he, let me put that for you guys real quick. It's like <laughs> there's this one not quite throwaway line, but you only really need it for arguments which are diffused later on. Yes. So because you need to actually evaluate an expression in order to, yeah. to have value. If it's just past the expression to mutate or whatever, it doesn't make sense. Right. So like, it is, I think, one of those things where unless you're writing functions for other people, then you're not really going to touch it. Maybe I've got like a potential case is like just to kind of expand on how I understand the, the point that Gus just just read is uh, let's let's imagine you're you're taking like bare taking a, as an argument like bare names right so then you could kind of pass that on um uh you know using curly curly to certain functions but let's imagine there's another function in the chain of things you want to do that expects uh, a character name um so there you would want to like quote the input and then kind of utilize it differently in different contexts of like sets of functions that you'll you'll use in like a chain of things that you want to do. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. It, sometimes I do wish they had more confusing examples. <laughs> yes, honestly, because it, it, they're like, oh, it, see, it's just here's this simple case, and you don't actually really need to do this. It's like, but but if this were more complicated, you would need to do this. It's like, yeah, but Can when you show me more complicated. <laughs> yes, yeah. The time it's, like it's like an XY eval problem. book was. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say the uh, the the now defunct tidy eval book was kind of helpful in that regard because it, it it you know. It seemed to have realistic use cases, but also it predated curly curly. Right. Um, I mean, if they just kind of like continued that logic of saying, here's some real world ish examples and let's kind of like work through them, I think that would probably be a bit more satisfying. And like if they even just like, if they threw out some of the like che checking bits from the actual tidyverse itself and just said, Here's a condensed version of like group by where we're using this. But yeah, like I've tried going through and learning from some of the tidyverse functions before. And it's definitely one of those things where like the people writing it know exactly what's going on and anyone outside trying to look in, you, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> that's, uh, that's valid. That's a really good way to describe what end quo and whatever it does. It's like it's it's what is used to to you inside of like tidyverse stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. like if you could describe the motivations in the sense of this is this power is dpliers mutate, for example. And you need to make sure it considers this as well as that, then you know, we'd probably understand it better. But like trying to translate it to non-dplyr makes it not great yeah. like think... we don't understand because it seems ridiculous that you'd ever need such a thing yeah so, 
Yeah, I mean, they do have this small example here, but even then they're diffusing it preemptively with vars. Right. Whereas group by just takes it and you don't need quotes and it just does its thing. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think I mean that is hinting at uh the ggplot2 case where in order to make it work with the old way they had to make it a little you know they had to do some weird programming I think that's like the only case I can think of mm -hmm. um is that the facet wrap one yeah that you have to Either like I always still just use the the by notation, the the tilde notation, because it's easier for me to remember than oh right, I use dplyr vars to wrap the things that I want to facet by. That's I guess I need to wrap the facet wrap. I don't know. Anyway, um, but it's because they want it to still work with the old notation that they had to make it also, or they had to make it a little funky in the new notation. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, closures are always something I've struggled to figure out what they are and like <laughs> why. So nothing Ooh, new. Hmm? Except John or Dan, no one can see that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, my my answer is always why my answer is still why because <laughs> but like it's not why it's usually why not do this instead yeah. actually is my usual response when i hear closures it's like okay do you actually need this because you probably don't uh, but that's my usual advice is you know just use data mask it's fine yes yeah. so, I, I do oh, think well just one more thing on this is that um this documentation is also for them. You know, at first it's for them, it, like if they add someone to the team or something. So the answer is when do you use it? Uh, when you are on the Tidyverse team. <laughs> and even then, only very special cases. <laughs> but they do come with some nice little helpers. So like I said, there's the single and plural for a few of them, but we've got end quote and end quotes to diffuse arguments as closures. And then if we wanted to wrap something and make a new closure instead of diffusing, then we would use quo or quos. If we want to get the expression or environment, there's quo gets for each. And then if we wanted to like manually assemble something from a an object and an environment, then we could use new closure to specify, sorry, expression and environment. We could use new closure or we can cast with as closure, which I believe grabs the current environment, but I'm actually not positive. So let's see. Okay, so for as closure, you can specify the environment. And I believe otherwise it would just be evaluated in your current environment. Um, formulas have a left-hand side and a right-hand side, or it's really just a call to tilde left and then right, which is kind of confusing, but that's sort of the basis of like, just the addition operator as well is really just secretly a call to the plus sign and then a left hand side and a right hand side. Um, and Arlang has some helpers to access and set the left and right hand side, as well as create new formulas with a specified environment. So rather than just like the base R here, this is a formula, then you get what you get. Um, you can now play around with it a little bit more. And these are the helpers, which um, similar to like names or call names, there's the regular and then the assignment version of each one. 
but you can do left hand side or right hand side. Um, same deal with getting the environment or setting it. If you want to make a new formula from parts, you can use new formula and then checking is formula or is bare formula. And there's a small difference between the two that I was not quite um, clear on. So is formula text whether X is a call to tilde is bare formula tests in addition that X does not inherit from anything else. I believe there's a missing other uh, than formula. But this is, like I said about the more complicated examples, um, if there was at least one example where is bare formula evaluated to true, then that would be pretty nifty. But it's funny because the documentation says it should evaluate to true when it's scoped. Like it's like this should be a bare formula, even though it's not actually a formula. And so this should say is bare formula equals true. Like if you read the comment, it says this should say true, and it says false. <laughs> okay. So what it's saying is if you make it a scoped formula, yeah, it should evaluate as a bare formula, like bare, it should be a bare formula or it should be considered a bare formula. Like if you're reading the comment and like, yeah, as, as intended, it's like, this should be a, this should be a bare formula. It's not, we don't know why. I wonder. If I try and run this real quick on my machine, I wonder if it's just a weird, if it's a weird or a, a constant. Yeah, I'm also getting false, so. Yep. <laughs> oh, but if I supply scoped equals false, then I get true. So. Should say scoped equals false. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> He's by scope equals false. It's considered a bare formula. That's strange. Um, yeah. So higher level questions. Where do you use like what's the difference between a formula and like an expression? Is it just the fact that it's got this tilde in it? So it's like a left hand side and right hand side. Like it's like a special kind of expression. They come with an environment, which I'm not sure expressions do. So, and that's sort that's where they relate to closures. Is that closures have an expression and an environment, and so so formulas like, like the base R formulas have a have a environment as well. Yep, I guess yep. That that's why sense. you know um, you can type like just x tilde y or whatever. And it's it like treats it as if you had quoted things, um, right? So like in yeah, in like a in like a linear model, when you do x inside y, it's not taking the expression; it is actually including the value of that inside. Okay. I mean, this is part of the idea behind Butcher, where you can take some model object, yeah, including a formula, and then chop off the environment, because if you have too many of them, it'll just start getting really big. And so okay. That's... Okay, that makes sense. So it's not an expression. It is actually... So like when you do LM, whatever mm -hmm. it is, it will actually capture the entire environment of that regardless of whether like you even if you provide it like the data argument it'll still like i believe if you do lm it will just capture date it will create a new environment with data in it but i'm not if you provide data and then if you don't then it'll capture the entire environment so what's is that what the difference is here 
stuff to I'm trying to think of I'm mental model here. I'm not sure. Will LM complain if you don't do? Just to give some little. Yeah, I think you have to supply data to LM. Uh, yeah. Okay, so is bare formula X tilde Y is true? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, and then we're so, just the different parts. Yeah. Okay. I'm just playing around with it. Um, one aspect of formulas is that they are subsetable, um, which is so just weird. Closures. Right. They they are they're their own thing that are closure like. <laughs> they are language objects. So if you do, um, they have closures, but they are not closures. <laughs> There. Yeah. Rebecca Butler asked a while back in R general about working with formulas. And there was a nice little dive into butcher and how formulas like maintain their environments. Um, yeah. I can let me grab the link for it. And then I can send it in the chat. You know, formulas are confusing to work with sometimes. Like if there's a function that expects them, then usually it's fine. But it's there's the fancy thing that like dcast does, lm does, where they're taking the environment or something, and they're not taking the formula as a string, and it's just like a I mean a call to something and then how are they actually working with that is something I still haven't figured out and that might be a closure related solution but yeah <laughs> well like if lm and data table are doing it somehow then there has to be a non-closure way to do it it's they're doing the things that our lang is using in order to like make closures. Yes. So and that is that is specifically one of the things I've tried figuring out in like the tidyverse source code and haven't been able to track down. I think part of it too is that there's just a lot of like internal structure that makes their functions very short because they can scaffold off of other things. And then other parts of it is just calling C. And at that point, I'm treading water. I don't know if there was anything else we wanted to go over. Mm -hmm. um, there was this little note, which at the bit about um, constants having empty environments. And so if you had a list of quotes, which are foo, one, and null, the environment is empty because foo is a character constant and won't change. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure why one plus one does have an environment. And I'm going to assume that it's just because it hasn't been evaluated yet. And then because it is something that needs to be evaluated, then it would then I think an environment. So you can yeah. actually override the plus sign, by the way. So if you've ever done that, I think I did that in, you were, you, I think you may have done this as well in Advent of Code a little while back. But no, it is I, taking the, so in one of the problems, you can actually like change what ad, adding and subtracting does, and it helps to like solve this problem. I can't remember, I, I don't have that. I, I think I used function factories for that. Was that like one of the monkey problems? I don't remember. It, it blurred together. But basically the reason why this isn't a, this so you can actually change the plus sign in this case um and then i didn't it's referring to that yeah yeah you don't need the first line of what i just pasted but the just the paste uh so yeah. the environment matters because if i if i send in one plus okay. one in my environment there it's not the same as your one plus one yeah, it's silly me for considering that someone might want to override the plus sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you met uh, ggplot, for example? Yep. Yeah, I know. And, <laughs> and lots of I, I still keep on, especially with base pipe, I keep on trying to pipe ggplot things together. Mm -hmm. um, especially with like leaflet, you can pipe leaflet to itself, but you can't like. It's just ggplot that does it. Let's see. I think it's a leftover of the fact that like pipes didn't exist when ggplot was invented. Yep. Yeah. Like even the McGritter pipe did not exist. Yep. And then there was, uh, there has been talk like people have asked a million times about well will there be like did you plot three with piping or could you just add can you make it work with either piping or plus and they're like uh nope <laughs> it works it is slightly different than piping kind of because you are kind of adding on and, and like the order matters and i don't know um but i did i double checked the two likely culprits, Tan, for what you're referencing. And in one, I used um, function factories. And then in the other one, I just used a list of operations and then a little bit of if, uh, if else to to get to the right one. So. Hmm. If if the one you're thinking from is from this past year, otherwise all bets are off. Yeah, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember needing it, but I don't remember why. So we'll see if I can find it. I will link it. But... I mean, I've been out of things to say about closures for like twenty minutes. So. <laughs> The honesty right. is appreciated. <laughs> I mean, like, they're confusing. It's not something that any of us are going to use regularly. So sort of knowing, understanding the role they play without necessarily understanding how to use them on your own is. Yeah, so I will say, for me. I guess, and there probably, there isn't really like there are things that are more straightforwardly metaprogramming that are in Arlang that mm -hmm. aren't involving quos and end quos and data masks and everything, you know, like mm -hmm. um, all their stuff about uh, argument checking, um, things about like, uh, that's the main thing that we haven't covered. So there's the function arguments section of the reference that I don't think we have slated to cover. Let me let me make sure. Let's see if we have a, a spot for that coming up. Because if not, we should try to talk through it. Um, where are you? Sign up sheet. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So those still kind of lie in the metaprogramming section of the universe. Okay. Um, if we want to try and go through them now, just looking at the documentation, and then I can write notes for it afterwards. I don't think they are too bad. Yeah, I don't see. Let's see. Um, oh, there is. Uh, no, we have a section for them at the end still okay. listed. So okay. um, we don't need to rush through them. So, yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> I feel like Arlang, especially like this stuff is like, there's more to, I think the whole point of the book club is that there's more to Arlang than this stuff. Like yeah. More to Arlang than metaprogramming, I think is where John and I had kind of intended to look at. It's like, okay, like, you know, we did advanced R, so if you learned it there, you know, move on. And if you don't, this is what you need to know about it kind of thing. But really i think the the meat of the book club's gonna be like okay yeah it does all this cool like stuff under the hood for tidyverse but we wanted to look at other things like air yeah. handling and condition and session so we got through it Head yeah start. so yeah if anyone you know has or wants to dig into anything any of the reference in the metaprogramming or diffused expression sections that we haven't done um you know i think we're we are done for the club we, we've covered them enough for those sections and then so i guess next week we have uh q a with hadley and i mentioned the seventh i don't think i'm going to be available if if the club still wants to meet and start working on uh the error message section that's okay and if you don't want to that's also okay um we can work that out in slack uh but yeah so we're going to be getting into the sections that are on um the conditions and uh error handling and then it's kind of grab bag so there's a bunch of like object um sections in the reference and there's a session section in the reference and a function arguments section in the reference and those are all just kind of other things that are helpful for, uh, I mean, effectively for metaprogramming, for, for things that you want to, they wanted to write in one place and use in all of their packages. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, that's where we are. So next week we'll be looking at um, the topic conditions up in the menu. Or sorry, no, next week we'll be Hadley. The week after that, we will be looking at that topic. Um, and uh, starting in there. So. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I will see yeah. everyone next week. Oh, I, there's the uh, form in lots of channels right now for uh, submitting questions through Slido. The sooner you do that, the better, so that I can start looking at them and sorting out, um, kind of try to make a flow out of them. So. <laughs>